Excellent. So hi, everyone. It is Monday again, and you know what that means. We have got uh, things that you will probably do with <laughs> Philip. <laughs> and things that support, Lisa will definitely do. Things that I will definitely do will be support you in all sorts of cool events that you're going to be doing moving forward. And having this conversation around um, what does it look like for you to be climbing? And this is week number three. So we've been having some great conversations around what does it look like when you go climbing on ice, which has been a, a complete, uh, for me, a little bit intimidating, but a great education of what does that actually mean? Um, but as we're climbing as event planners, so for those of you that have been trying to climb out of what COVID has been, we're still looking at um, new iterations for 2022, and you might still be climbing. So that this part of it is so important. When I use this analogy of climbing and started this, Philip, you were uh, top of mind for me because you are somebody that I met a couple of years ago. And then you told me stories of um, not just climbing the ice, but some of the challenges that you faced. And I, I still can't get it out of my head because you said you got <laughs> frostbite <laughs> once where you're like, I think I didn't feel my fingers for a while. And then you, you realize that yeah. you got this frostbite and you come home, but then you still are climbing. It's still something that you're still doing, even though you have faced all these <laughs> challenges. So why don't yeah. you introduce yourself one last time and then yeah. we'll, we'll dive right into the topic for today. <laughs> um, oh gosh, I don't know. What should I say this time? I feel like every time I introduce myself, I say something different. <laughs> <laughs> you're a multi person. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, yeah, for those who don't know me, my name is Philip Setter. I'm, I guess, uh, a climber by hobby and passion and um, for business, I'm a financial professional, so I have several different companies, and um, they are slowly but surely I'm bridging the gap between professional and and passion and putting them together, and so that's been really interesting for me. So, um, yeah, I guess that's I don't know what else I can say well, in the third find, intro. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I yeah third intro. I don't know if I've actually asked you this, but do you find that there is carryover like with your climbing and whether that's with clients or if it's with how you do your professional work? Do you find that, I would guess, because you were you, so you're showing up, well, you know, yeah, that's, similar. That's a good question, actually. Um, and the answer is actually no, for the, for the most part, like for the last seven years in business, I've, I've been pretty, um, I guess, distinguished between one life and the other. Mm -hmm. And like a lot of my clients actually had no idea that I ever would do. And it's funny, actually, because I was talking to, um, this was probably like three years ago. And I, and it, it was so funny because I was talking to a rep for a company and, and this lady had only known me in a professional setting. And so every time she saw me, you know, I was wearing like a three piece suit and I had the <laughs> handkerchief and my oh, hair was, nice. was perfectly combed. Then, you know, my dress shoe, cause I, that was, you know, I lived downtown. My office was downtown. I, you know, I had that persona and, and I remember I'd probably known this lady for like two years at this point, And she said, well, what are you, what are you going to do this weekend? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go out climbing this weekend. And she's like, she's like, what are you going to go climb? Like it's winter outside, you know, like you're going to get your hands dirty and you don't do that. Phil. <laughs> and I was like, oh. I was like, well, no, I kind of do actually. <laughs> and she was blown away that, that, wow. um, that I had, I did anything different than that. So for the most part, no, I've actually, I've kept my, my professional life and personal life completely separate and it's only been in the last year uh that I've started to kind of bring them together more and more and and now with um with the the starting of this affinity life company and bringing the uh extreme sports insurance now that division of the company to fruition now I'm really kind of bridging the gap between my professional life and my personal life um because now all of all of the community that I'm in are, are my clients or are hopefully soon to be clients um, so that's, yeah, so that's been really interesting, actually. Cool. And it's been, it's been a ton of fun. So, um, well, yeah. and you, you know, the personality, right. You'd also know sort of what they're looking for. Um, the, not yeah. just the challenges, but the risks involved. And then when you tie that into how you show up that, that you would be somebody that would probably be pretty tenacious with the clients and, and make sure that you're covering all the bases. Like I can imagine, we talked on the first conversation about preparation and so that could also be something where, um, what would it look like for, for you to be uh, helping that client prepare? And, and so mm -hmm. I think there's probably some of those crossover pieces that um, 
would help your clients and also help you relate to not just the extreme sport clients, but all sorts of people that are mm. looking for, for someone that's going to work with excellence and make sure that everything's handled and that they can trust yeah. you, which actually kind of brings me to a roundabout point that we were going to talk about today. But this idea of trust, and mm. we've been talking a lot about what it takes personally for you to climb and, and to not just be the personality to climb, but prepare to climb mm. and make sure you've got what you need and to uh, manage yourself when you're actually on that ice space. And, and, uh, and so I was mentioning last week, um, just sort of off camera that you're not alone though, you've got a partner. And, mm. and so what is that like? Like when we're talking about you and your clients and how you've got their back, you do have somebody that is typically either with you ahead of you or behind you, you know, on this ice space. Can you tell us a little bit about what that's like for you to have somebody that is with you, whether they're more experienced or, or not, what's that like to have someone with you when you're climbing? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it's, it's actually really interesting. Cause I mean, the sport of climbing in and of itself is, is like a very soloist sport. Like when you are climbing, it's you on that climb. You're managing your, your strength, your fears, your, your, mental, your, your mental capacity, um, and you're pushing through. And it's, it's very much a you thing. You're in your own head, right? But at the same time, I mean, you need to go out with a partner, obviously, unless you're a free solo and everything. You need to go out with a partner. And that relationship is, um, it's really, it's, it's a really interesting one, right? Because there's so many different factors that play into a really good partnership. You need to find obviously someone that, that you get along with. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's really important because you're going to be spending <laughs> a, a lot day. of time with them. <laughs> you're going to be spending all the time in the car with them, driving out to the climb, walking into the climb, climbing the climb. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's, there's some people out there that climb really well with certain people, but they don't like him. And I always thought that's kind of interesting because I never took the climb as a success of the day. I took the overall uh, entirety of the day as a success. And so it's the drive out for me, the good conversation, the enjoyable partnership, you know, a nice walk, you know, if all those things come together, you have a really nice day. And, and, and if you just were focusing on the climb and that was your metric of success, uh, probably more often than not, you would walk away with disappointment because sometimes <laughs> you don't get to climb it. You don't finish it for whatever reasons. Maybe there's dangers associated with it. It's not in or avalanche mm -hmm. dangers change or whatever, be it. So a partnership is, is really interesting. I mean, you need to find someone that you like. Um, you also need to find someone that, that you're both at similar skill levels, right? Or else mm -hmm. there'll be um, an unbalance or an imbalance, pardon me, of, of uh, workload, right? And that's mm -hmm. not necessarily that good in and of itself because then one person is going to be doing all the harder things. And while sometimes that might be good, if you want to find a long-term partner, you should really find someone where you can equally share the workload. So when someone is just absolutely fried, the other person can yeah. pick it up and it, and it ebbs and flows, you know, there's seasons to this. Some people might feel really good early season or middle or late season. And then hopefully you'll find a partner that has the, the opposite of that. So you guys can right. kind of yin yeah. yang throughout the season. Yeah. But it's, it's um yeah, partnership. It's, it's really interesting. You know, I I've climbed with, with dozens of people and, you know, I've narrowed it down now in, in these years that I climb now, I've narrowed it down to, you know, select few partners that I really like to climb with and, and so the importance to me is one, I have to like them, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I don't like them, it's going to turn into a it's long day. It's going to be a long day. <laughs> and, and I've climbed with people that I don't like. And, and you know, I find that I just, I don't have really a good day, even if I enjoy the climb. And right. that's not really what I'm going out for. So I, I need to like them for one. They need to be a, a similar skill level around there for two. Um, and then we need to be on the same wavelength for safety. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that's really important, right? Um, and for me, like I've had accidents out in, in the, in the climbing uh, world and, and I've had, I've lost people in the climbing world. And so it's, it's something that's really important to me. So you want to find someone that you're both um, responsible for each other. Mm -hmm. And so when one person is maybe overlooking something, the other person can pick it up. Um, Cause at, at no time is anyone perfect, right? We're always going to mm -hmm. miss things or, or have our own biases that, that cause us to overlook things. And the more that we can rely on our partner um, to try and pick up those things that we miss and, and have a, an overall reach of safety, um, the better, the better the partnership can be. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. partnerships are, are quite an interesting thing. And, and finding, 
finding the right partner can take a long time, right? And, and I've climbed with a lot of people, um, you know, to boil it down to a few partners that I, you know, I really enjoy climbing with. I trust them. And, and I know that, we're, you know, when we go out, not only are we going to have a good day, but we're both going to put in an equal amount of work and, and, and share the load between, uh, between, you know, pitches and between the day. So, yeah. right. Well, and I, I wonder, so a lot of people watching this will be event planners or they're working on planning teams. Mm -hmm. And there is that, I believe that there is that level of excellence that we all shoot for at the same time, there has to be that personal relationship that you're building mm -hmm. as well. And, and I think in some ways it actually, some of my best friends have been through some of the projects I've worked on or the events I've worked on or just through teams totally. that I've been part of, whether it's volunteer or whatever. And, and it's because we're really all shooting for the same thing and we're watching out for each other. We're, we're putting everything we've got into learning what we need to learn to do the job because it's always more satisfying when you get to the top and, and you've really not just learned along the way, but you're being able to use those skills and put them into practice. So I can yeah. see how actually going with somebody that is at a similar skill level and you are sharpening each other, you know, as far as giving sort of that um, next level kind of experience for each other. So that's a yeah. really cool part of, I think, what we can be looking for in 2022, where we might even have people um, that we know in events that are have skilled up with technology, for example, or they have really leaned into what does it mean to run a hybrid event, or they are starting to work with other partners that are have other skill sets. And so I think there is something about really learning how to skill up and be with the right people that can take us to the next level. So that's really cool. I love that. It wasn't our topic for today, but I think that's so important. Yeah, um, totally. But let's, let's jump right into, we were talking about um, changing conditions and something that you told me a couple of months back was that when you're climbing on ice, the difference with rock, because I've, I've climbed in the mountains and I've climbed in gyms and that kind of thing, but the difference with rock is you're not getting the same kind of shifting and the same kind of adjustment as you're climbing. And mm -hmm. even if you've climbed one route, you may climb it again and it won't have a lot of changes. Yep. But when you were talking about ice, that there's, there's not just changes season to season, but in the day you're climbing, <laughs> yeah. there's some changes. I was explaining that to my husband. Yeah. He's like, that is so crazy. Like some of the things that you were mentioning about, um, you know, the temperature, how that changes, but it's, it's counterintuitive to what you're thinking. So I'd love for you to share with um, people watching just what that is like for you when you're actually managing the changing conditions. Yeah. Um, and, and this will just be sort of you on the mountain, <laughs> as opposed to you and your partner, because maybe we'll have yeah. a, a good series of interviews yeah. with your partner someday, but for today, oh, that would be too much fun. <laughs> that would be too much fun. I would love that. Yeah, it's it's definitely like rock climbing is is very static, right? I mean, if you have a route, I mean, there's people that will project and project just means to do the same route over and over again until they get it right. Um, especially really hard routes, you know, you want to remember where the holds are. Maybe it's there, maybe it's up here. And over time, you can really start to get a rhythm and understand it. And it's the same basically every time. Um, and so you can kind of figure it out. You can memorize it, memorize the moves and do it. Okay. Ice is totally different. And, and I explained this before, but I'd, I'd love to talk about it again. So what I love about ice is it's, it's always different. It's never the same. So from year to year, an ice climb will come in and they usually will put, um, you know, an ice climb, if it comes in every year, at least every other year, they'll put it as a main ice climb. So this comes in at least every year, maybe every two years it comes in. So that becomes kind of a, a normal ice climb. But even though it comes in every year, it will come in different every single year. So it could form different due to weather conditions, due to wind, due to how cold it was, how much rain they got, how much snow they got, how much solar aspect was, was on the climb. All these different variables will affect how the actual climb is from year to year. And then even within that specific context, from day to day, or even from, from the morning to the afternoon, it'll change. And so when you're climbing, it's not about memorizing any of the moves. It's not about, because there is no memorization, it's literally yeah. changing. Uh, it's such a dynamic environment, right? So yeah. you really need to, to be adaptable to so many different changing conditions. And a, really a lot of that is gained through experience, right? And mm -hmm. if you just, you have to kind of go through that experience to start to understand, okay, this, this sounding ice, 
all the little variables, what it sounds like, what it feels like, what it looks like, um, you know, how the weather conditions are looking, if it's windy, all these variables you take into consideration, the more experience you get, and I'm by no means am I, am I saying that I'm the most experienced, but you start to gather all this information and then you can make decisions based on the different variables that are presented to you. So you might say, okay, that, that sounded a little off. It sounded hollow. You know, maybe, maybe the ice isn't actually frozen all the way through. Maybe it's aerated, right? And aerated means that, you know, there's holes all, imagine, you know, aerating your lawn, there's holes all throughout your lawn. Aerated ice means there's holes all throughout the ice. So it's really poor quality ice, right? Or maybe it's, you know, really soft because the, the weather's warm. So for example, um, you know, this is, this is how drastic a climb can change in a matter of days. So on Friday, I actually went out and we did our second ice climb of the season. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah. And we went up to this area called Storm Creek and which is way, way up there. It's like up 93 South. It's going towards Infamere. It's at like 2,600 meters elevation. It's like way up there. It's like three and a half hour hike from the parking lot. So you would assume that it's really cold up there, but it wasn't, it was five degrees. It was raining actually, which is one of the weirdest experiences <laughs> I've ever had where I was getting rained on, I was climbing it, but we were climbing it and it was just, it was slush. There's no other way I can use to describe it, but slush, the ice was not ice, the ice was slush. And so as we were putting in screws, I realized about halfway, I was like, these screws are pretty much pointless because it's not really gonna be held. And this is all just psychological for us. If, if any of us were to fall, these screws, like it's in slush, it's basically like a Slurpee. It would just rip out. There's nothing actually holding it together. And so that was on Friday, but then on Sunday, the conditions changed to about minus five. And so then the climb was formed up and screws protected them. So the difference between two days meant that if you fell, the screws wouldn't hold you and you would fall basically to the bottom or to your death. And the, on the other side, the screws will hold you and, and you'll be fine. And so like those variables, in and of itself are things that you need to understand and adapt to those conditions as they're happening. Mm. Cause that's how, that's how quickly it can change from something that can protect you or it couldn't protect you. So right. it's, it's definitely, yeah, it's, it's really interesting, right? Cause you're not, you're never doing the same thing twice. You're always adapting and you're, you're just trying to gather more and more information to make the best choices while you're climbing. And so it's, it's having the tools. So I would guess that you would have different tools for different conditions. Is that, um, or, or is it more that you're, you're, it's more, it's you're more adjusting. how you're climbing, what decisions oh, okay. you're making. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, like in the example of, of Friday, if we were a little bit smarter and, and kind of wish we were, we probably would have stopped halfway and just said, let's, let's get off. It's a, the, the consequences are, are higher than, than we would like to participate in. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but no, as for like tools, I think most of all the tools is your own mind figuring out hmm. how to swing. If you should swing more, if that ice is good, if the hold will stick, if the screws are good, is the protection going to be good? Um, should you keep going or should you just stop and come down? Like, like I would say that's probably right. what it is. Well, and we did, we did talk, I forget what, whether it was last week or the week before, but we talked about sometimes, um, doing the right thing is also coming off of the wall or, or taking yourself out of that game and, yep. and reconfiguring or, or trying another time. Totally. And so I think I, I like what you're saying that managing the conditions isn't so much us manipulating what is happening with the ice. Cause you know, nature is nature and you can't yep. control the ice. And, yep. and again, for a lot of people that have been working at planning their events over this last year, there's a lot of what's going on that we can't control. There's some things that we can adjust a little bit and, and make some decisions, but we're making decisions around a situation that is just happening. And so I think for many of us, it's, it's more looking at, like you're saying, kind of drawing from your experience and saying, is this safe? Is this um, going to be great for our, our business, you know, in the long run? Yep. Are we uh, as a nonprofit team, you know, and you're asking volunteers to be on site at events, is this truly what's going to in, in, um, engage them, but also inspire them to be with us long term? How do you kind of manage that? So I really understand um, the idea that there will be immovable conditions sometimes. Um, can't change it. So what do yeah. you do? Yeah. So I, I appreciate that. Sometimes we can have a, a new tool or, or like for many of us, we're doing a lot of online kind of events, um, which is a new tool for some of us. Mm -hmm the the 
uh, um, the headspace we need to be in is probably more important than the technology we learn. Totally. I think a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important. So, so with your events, cause I know we talked a little bit about the events that you have planned or that you were planning before COVID um, and before these lockdowns and changes to how you're actually interacting with your clients. Are you seeing how um, as the conditions change and morph a little bit moving into the next year, what you're excited about for the events that you're going to be able to plan? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I really haven't looked at events that closely over the last year. I've really been trying to, and I don't know if we talked about this on camera, off camera, but I'm happy to talk about it on camera. Um, (laughs) I was at, at, at the start of COVID, I was definitely getting event fatigue. And Mm. I think we, we had been running multiple seminars um, a month for roughly about four years, pretty well nonstop. Um, all over Canada. And I was really starting to get to the point where I was getting a little bit burnt out from, from the seminars and from um, the traveling and, and, and just the, the constant effort required of all of it. And mm-hmm. so when COVID started, it was a little bit of an opportunity for me in my business to take a step back and really look at what I wanted to accomplish with my business. And if I could achieve that with either no events or at least less events. And so that's really what I've been trying to do since the start of COVID is put a lot more of those processes of events into an automated format, whether that be recorded webinars or um, sales emails or processes or automations that are they're set up in advance and, and not necessarily something that I continually do um, live all the time. And that's really what I spent a lot of COVID doing was building a lot of that out and, and implementing it. And it's been working over the last year to two years now. And so honestly, you know, I, I've been thinking about it quite a bit um, now that we've been open up a lot more. And I know that, that there's a gentleman here in Calgary, um, Kim Moody, and, and I follow him quite frequently and, and he runs a lot of events as well. And he just actually ran, I believe his first one um, like two weeks ago. And, and I thought like, huh, that's really interesting. You know, it's like the first one back, but Totally. That's pretty cool. And it kind of, you know, I had that twing, like, do I want to run an event? And, and that, that real burning desire wasn't there for me yet, you know? And so mm-hmm. I, I don't have any future plans right now. I, I really am kind of putting a lot of effort into automating a lot of those processes because it, mm-hmm. I did have a lot of fatigue at the end there. And, and, and so I think, yeah, it's definitely something long-term that if I can do a little bit less of them and, and automate a little bit more of it, I'll be happy with that. But I mean, we'll see, you know, I, I really do love running events. And, and I mean, we were just talking about one before we, we started this live broadcast about doing a 24 hour climbing um, for charity thing. And I mean, that's an event in and of itself. And so right. possibly it'll, it'll change maybe from um, business events to more personal events. So, right. And, and like you were saying earlier, kind of marrying the business and the personal, I think yeah. is what really people are Um, I've always thought it's been effective to do that in any kind of an event. And when we step back and say, is this event not just making us the money or new clients and maybe you're getting the results kind of on the paper or on paper, it's looking good, but it's not energizing you. And so we talk a lot about if there is, even before COVID was a thing for events, um, this idea of really giving yourself space to be yourself and to show up as yourself. And then your clients, like you said, going out to, to climb with somebody that you don't really like, it's kind of like that in business too, right? Where yeah. what if we had clients, not that they're all similar to you or like you, but, but that there's this, this camaraderie or, or there's a feeling like you get each other and you have yeah. sort of a similar, um, you enjoy spending time. Yeah. And if we could fill our clients, you know, I, I was going to say our dance card, <laughs> Rolodex <laughs> in the old days. You know, I used to have folders with business cards and that was yep. the old days. But if you had people yep. that you were really energized by and that they were bringing something to the table um, for you as well, I think that'd be really cool to see where you're going to be going in the next year and and starting to integrate some of those, like a 24-hour um this would be a fundraiser, but at the same time, why not take a small group of clients out and, you know, get their feedback and, and really get to know them. And then that feeds into other kind of workshops and, and the educational, from what I understand, the kind of the educational piece that you give them at a webinar or something. I think that, that 
would be exciting for myself, even with some of the people we work with, or if our, whether it's our insurance person or whoever it is would invite us to a day mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. My husband and I, I know like we're kayakers. So it would be like, well, That'd that sounds kind of fun, fun yeah. and we could do both. And yeah, so I think definitely. there's a lot with the shifting of those conditions or these conditions worldwide. I think people will be more open to events that will Ad, not only adapt to the conditions, but probably be a little more fun, a little more yep. where we can bring our whole selves. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I really hope so. Like, as I mentioned earlier on, the bridging of the personal and, and professional life here within my own life, the more that I start to do that, I think the opportunities for those type of unique events will start to present themselves and, and mm -hmm. I'd love to pursue them. Totally. So, yeah. I love this conversation and this is our last official one. So anything you want to leave with us before we say goodbye, and then I'll, I'll just share oh. the three things that you're going to be sharing in the magazine so that people <laughs> can actually go in and read the story. We've got the story yeah. coming up as well. Yeah. You always put me on the spot like this and ask me. At the end. <laughs> <laughs> and I never have any good answer to give here. So um, is there anything that I want to, to leave? I, I have nothing good. So I felt like if I would share anything, it would just be a platitude and there's no point. There you go. Well, that. let me just sort of cover what we've covered in these last three. So I've got your article up here, but the first one was luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Um, and for all of you, you can actually go back to the YouTube channel and you can listen to these conversations that I've been having with Philip. Um, the second one was life's greatest joys come through its hardest times. That was a, a great one for many of us that are going through some hard times right now. And the mastering the climb, it means adapting to the conditions. And this also the idea of really uh, who's beside you in that journey, who's actually partnering with you and not just to experience what you are experiencing together, but you are um, really building each other up, uh, being able to skill up as a community. And so for many of you that are out there still on the climb, still trying to find your way to the top, my daughter uh, made her way up Sulphur Mountain a couple of days ago, <laughs> all by herself. And and she was at the top and, and really enjoyed just being able to see and the clouds parted a little bit so she could see, you know, the range from there. And I think for many of us, we're just waiting and hoping and continuing to climb, wanting to see a bit of that view from the top. So if you guys are interested, we would love to have you at our virtual launch. That's going to be on November the 10th. This is the Moments Magazine Event Planning Ideas and Inspiration last issue. We've got 10 that have been out. They're all evergreen. You can read them anytime. They're going to be worth uh, flipping through and taking your read through anytime. Uh, this one is pretty special for me. I think the conversations around climbing are so valuable for us as event planners right now. So thank you so much, Philip, for joining me and humoring me on, on really digging into what does it mean to climb and what does that mean for us as event planners? Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. It's been a ton of fun and, and I appreciate you letting me join you on this. So Absolutely. Well, I will see you on our climb that I will promise to be on someday. <laughs> I look forward to it. Awesome. Have a great day. Okay, you too.